In this video, I'll introduce you to the most basic and important performance metrics we use when assessing portfolio performance. We'll start off talking about the comparison universe and the benchmark you should choose. Then, I'll describe metrics like Jensen's Alpha and the Sharpe Ratio. Finally, I'll go through a more detailed example where I calculate all of our performance metrics. The simplest and most popular way to assess your fund's relative performance is to compare the portfolio's return with the returns of comparable funds. To do this, you need to determine your fund's comparable universe. The comparable universe is the benchmark composed of a group of funds or portfolios with similar risk characteristics. We can see this if we look at any fund in Morningstar. So here I have an example of the Glenmead Quant International Equity Fund. And that fund, its performance is listed in blue. So that fund has underperformed not only its category, its category is foreign large value funds, but also the broader index, the broader Morningstar Global Markets Index. Uh, so here, this is one of the reasons why we want to benchmark. This is one of the reasons why we also want to identify our comparable universe or compare comparison universes, because even if our fund performed very well, if other funds or an index with similar risk characteristics outperformed, that's not very good. Or it indicates that we, we technically underperformed regardless of how good our return was. One big benefit of the benchmark is that it allows you to control for the risk of your portfolio. As you know from your earlier classes, you can accept more market risk in exchange for a higher return. Benchmarking allows us to compare our fund's performance with that of comparable funds. If our fund is underperforming the benchmark, this will often cause the management of our fund to be replaced, and it'll often cause investors to pull their money out of our fund. Now, there are several ways you can identify the comparison universe and the proper benchmark. You can restrict the total universe to funds based on some characteristics. These characteristics might be as simple as oh, let's say similar asset classes. So let's say your portfolio contains only equity. We might want to only have a comparison universe of equity funds. We might also want to restrict our, our classification based on where our fund and our comparable funds are investing. So if our fund is only investing in, let's say, Canadian stocks, well, we'd only want to compare our fund with the performance of, well, other funds that only invest in Canada. And so as you can see, there's uh, not that many ETFs that, uh, that focus solely on Canadian equity. There are some other tools that you can use to identify the comparison universe. So Bloomberg has a search function that allows you to search for funds and restrict your comparison universe based on different fund sizes, asset classes, fees, uh, goals, uh, we'll use that function, the FSRC function in class. Uh, but really, this is arguably our best way uh, to identify our comparison universe, essentially restricting that universe based on the characteristics of each fund. There are some other ways that you can identify the comparison universe. The, the next best option is to, well, essentially, regress your, your fund's returns on those of each of the comparison portfolios and select the, the funds that have the highest R squared. So our, I, our R squared is our explanatory power of our model. So the higher the R squared, the closer it is to one, the greater the, the fund on our right-hand side of our regression explains the variation in returns of our, our our fund, our fund on the left-hand side of the regression. Again, you'll see this in class. Finally, if our IPS restricts us to only long positions uh, in an asset class like U.S. equity, we could choose to compare our performance to that of a very broad-based index like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ composite. If you remember, the benchmark for Ball State Smith is the S&P 500 index. I believe this was initially set because it's the best representative of our investable universe. Now let's talk about the performance metrics we can use. You've already seen some of these in earlier classes, but they're extremely important in portfolio management. First, we'll talk about the Sharpe Ratio. In portfolio management, the Sharpe Ratio is often called the Sharpe Index. We use historical data to calculate this. 
Next, we'll talk about the trainer measure, which is very similar to the Sharp Index, except that our denominator is the portfolio beta. Then, I'll walk you through the calculation of Jensen's alpha. This is essentially the portfolio alpha, and it represents the amount by which the portfolio outperformed what it was predicted to return based on its beta. Finally, I'll show you the information ratio, which is a measure of alpha over residual returns. Now let's dive deeper into the Sharpe Index. The Sharpe Index, or Sharpe Ratio, is our weighted average portfolio return during a period minus the risk-free rate during the period, all divided by the standard deviation of the portfolio. This is arguably our most important advanced performance metric since we can use it in the modern portfolio theory calculations. The greater this is, the greater the risk-adjusted return of the portfolio. Our standard deviation is our primary measure of portfolio risk, although we do have some others. The trainer measure is the weighted average portfolio return, just RP, minus our risk free rate over the period, all divided by the weighted average portfolio beta. The beta is our portfolio's measure of market risk. It's the same beta that you used in the CAPM. Just like the Sharp Index, we use historical data in this calculation when comparing the performance of our portfolio with that of other portfolios. Next, we have Jensen's alpha. Now the alpha is the same alpha from the CAPM calculations. Jensen's alpha is the weighted average portfolio alpha. We calculate it by rearranging the model form of the CAPM equation. We take our average return on the portfolio and subtract the expected return on the portfolio, which is the risk-free rate plus the portfolio beta times the market risk premium. If the alpha is positive, it means our portfolio outperformed its expected return based on the CAPM. If the alpha is negative, it means our portfolio underperformed during that period. Finally, we have the information ratio. The information ratio divides the alpha of the portfolio by the non-systematic risk, or the firm-specific risk if you prefer that term. Now this firm-specific or non-systematic risk is the risk associated with the individual firm rather than the firm's exposure to the market. This risk which we referred to using the sigma E sub P, is the residual from our CAPM regression. I'll show you an example of this calculation in a few minutes, but it's easily calculable. Uh, this risk can be defined many ways. Some argue it measures the amount of risk the manager takes relative to the benchmark, though. Now let's take a look at an example where we're asked to compare several portfolios, P, Q, and M. Portfolios P and Q are actively managed funds, while Portfolio M is the market portfolio. Think of it as the S&P 500. Notice that the market portfolio's alpha is 0 and its beta is 1. The, its standard deviation and information ratio are 0 and its R-squared is 1. All of these make sense because it's the market. Uh, so the market has a, an average beta of 1 and you can't up the market isn't going to, on average, outperform the market, so alpha is zero, and the market returns perfectly explain market returns, so our R squared is one, and we have zero information ratio. Okay, uh, now let's examine the actively managed portfolios, P and Q, starting with their sharp ratios. You can see the portfolio Q has the higher sharp ratio, which indicates it offered a higher risk-adjusted return over uh, the period. Portfolio Q also has the higher trainer measure, which again indicates a higher risk-adjusted return. As we move down to the regression statistics, keep in mind that what we're, what we're doing is regressing the returns of portfolios P and Q on the return of the market portfolio M. The alpha, beta, error term, and R-squared are all automatically calculated in the regression output, and we can calculate the information ratio from the regression alpha and the error information. Notice that Portfolio Q has a positive alpha, indicating that it outperformed what it was expected to offer based on the CAPM. Portfolio P also has a positive alpha, which is good. Notice that the beta of Q is double that of Portfolio P, indicating that Portfolio Q is exposed to far more market risk than Portfolio P. Portfolio Q's regression error is also significantly larger than that of P. This indicates that Q's portfolio exhibits far more firm-specific risk 
than P's portfolio. Our information ratio indicates that P's ratio of active return to active risk is significantly larger than Q's. That's actually a very good thing. It indicates that when portfolio P's management actively selects securities, they're able to select securities that offer a positive alpha and a relatively low level of firm-specific risk. Although by most metrics we would say Portfolio Q outperform Portfolio P, both of these funds have good performance metrics. Notice that I didn't use any one performance metric to determine which portfolio you should invest in. There's a reason for this. Different performance metrics indicate different things to different investors. Some investors want to invest in only one portfolio, while others want to build a diversified portfolio that includes multiple funds. If you're just investing in one fund, then you should focus on the Sharp Ratio, since it represents your return scaled by total risk. However, if you're building a portfolio that includes not just the fund in question, the trainer measure would arguably be the better metric. This is because the denominator in the trainer measure is beta. If your portfolio is well diversified, firm specific risk should be diversified away and only the total portfolio's weighted average market risk should matter. Since beta is our measure of market risk, the trainer measure is the better measure for determining which fund to add to a diversified portfolio. To end this video, I think it would be helpful to walk through a full example where I calculate all of the measures I just discussed. I'll use the Port Example tab of this lecture's Excel spreadsheet, and so let's get started. So I'm over here on the Port Example tab, and what I've done is I've collected real-world data for a benchmark. Uh, this is the Vanguard Value ETF. Uh, this is going to be our market. And then I've collected data on three funds, the Guggenheim Alpha Opportunity Institutional Fund. Uh, its ticker symbol is SAOIX, the AVPVX, which is an American Century Value Fund, and then also SEVAX, the Guggenheim Midcap Value Fund. So what we're going to do is we're going to calculate these four measures for each of these four, or for each of these three portfolios, assuming the benchmark is the the Vanguard Value ETF. All right, so to get us started, we need to get the Sharp Index. And the Sharp Index is, well, it's it's really just our return, or our average return over a period, minus the risk-free rate divided by the standard deviation over that same period. And I've done something fairly standard here. I've collected 60 months of return data for each of these funds and the benchmark. Uh, so we have 60 data points here. So what I'll do is I'll take equals average, and I'll take the return on our first fund for each period, so the average monthly return. I'll go down to the bottom here. And now I'm taking the average of SAOYX's returns. I'll subtract from that the average risk-free rate. And I'll divide all of that by the standard deviation of our SO, SAOIX fund. And there we go. Our Sharp Index is 36.19. Next, we'll get our trainer measure. And the difficulty we have here is that Unlike the Sharp Index, where we could just use the standard deviation, here we need our beta. Because remember, our trainer measure has the beta of our portfolio in the denominator. So what I need to do is run the regression, the, or the CAPM regression, that calculates the beta, and it'll also calculate our alpha. So to do this, I'm going to go up to the Data tab, go to Data Analysis, click on Regression, and I've already set it up here, but I'll do it again. So keep in mind, when we run a the CAPM regression, we're regressing our fund's excess returns, so the return minus the risk-free rate. Let me just show you this. So the return of the fund in each period minus the risk-free rate in that period. We're regressing that on the excess returns of the market. So the excess return of the market is just our market return minus the risk-free rate return. 
So here, I'm going to regress this column, so SAOIX's excess returns, on the excess returns of the market. And because I've highlighted the labels or the first row here, I've got labels checked. And I'm going to output this at cell Y11, so right about here-ish. And I'm asking the computer for residuals. And you'll see why that's important in a second. So here is the output for our regression. So notice here that we have our beta. So our coefficient on the market excess return is our beta. So our beta here is 0.5479-ish. The coefficient on the intercept, just like any cap M regression, is going to be our alpha. So technically, this is going to be our Jensen's alpha. Uh, our R squared here is relatively high. Uh, and then down here we have our residuals. So these residuals allow each observation to balance if you plug the observations into the model form of, or the regression form of the cap M. These residuals are the error terms. Uh, they represent the, the firm-specific risk, uh, or rather the standard deviation of these will represent the firm-specific risk. But let's just calculate the trainer measure right now. So same thing as the Sharpe index. We take the average return on our stock minus the average risk-free rate, or in this case, it's funds, and we divide that by the beta. And so our trainer measure here, obviously it's a lot lower, but 1.62%. What's more important is how that stacks up to that of the other two funds. Next, our Jensen's alpha. Like I just said, our Jensen's alpha is going to be right here. This is our monthly alpha. It indicates, if I put this in percentage terms, that over the, the five-year period that we have here, this fund, SAOIX, outperformed the benchmark by about 26 basis points a month for that, that five-year period. Uh, so technically, I could just plug this 0.26% in right here, or I could just show you the, the actual calculation that I, I gave you in the, the slide. So that calculation I gave you was that alpha is equal to the average return on the portfolio. This is the, the actual return on the portfolio uh, minus the average uh, risk-free rate plus the beta times the average market excess return. So why don't I, I just go through that very quickly and you'll see that it equals this, this coefficient on the intercept. So first things first, I'll take the average return on the fund and I'll subtract from that the essentially all the components that would allow me to create the cap M. So we have our average risk-free rate plus our beta right here times the excess return on the market or the average excess return on the market. And there we go. I'll close my parentheses and I'll hit enter and yeah, sure. Uh, notice here that the alpha that I just calculated is exactly the same as what Excel calculated when I asked it to run the regression, 0.26 or 0.256. There's rounding here. Okay, lastly, we want the information ratio. And the information ratio is just our alpha that we just calculated divided by the standard deviation of the error terms of the regression. This this entire thing, the standard deviation of the error terms, this is essentially our firm-specific risk. And that's why I wanted to get the residuals here. These residuals are the error terms in our, our regression. So I'm just going to take our Jensen's alpha and divide that by our standard deviation of all of these residuals. And notice here, I have our information ratio. Now, I could go through 
the calculations for these other two. I think that makes my, my video a touch long, but obviously uh, in these greens, I'm working the calculations. In the reds, I've already worked the calculations. So I'll just go to these and you can go through the calculations yourselves or you know, feel free to ask me to do this in class. Uh, but notice here that, I'll tell you what, I'll zoom in so it's easier to see, but of these three portfolios, these three funds, uh, the AVPVX has the highest Sharpe index. Uh, it also has the lowest trainer measure. It has a negative alpha, so this indicates that AVPVX underperform the market, while the other two, the SAOIX and the SEVAX, outperform the market. And our information ratio is the highest for SAOIX. So, you know, we, we don't really just want to rely on one particular measure here, but SAOIX looks like a pretty healthy portfolio, or it looks like it outperformed the market, and it had a fairly high sharp ratio relative to certainly the SEVAX. Uh, it, out, uh, it outperformed its other competitors in terms of trainer measure, and it had the highest information ratio. The only thing it didn't perform the best in is the sharp ratio. So, I mean, every investor is going to be different here, but, you know, if I'm investing, if I'm including the SAOIX as part of my individual portfolio, uh, so let's say I'm, I'm allocating 20% of my total net worth to a single portfolio, uh, I'm probably picking the SAOIX. Maybe I'm only allocating 5% or 10% to that. But there you go. Okay, so let's summarize. We started off talking about benchmarking. You should always select an appropriate benchmark for your fund that assesses the performance of a comparable set of assets. The benchmark allows you to compare your performance to that of a similar portfolio. Next, we walked through several different advanced metrics like the Sharpe Ratio, Information Ratio, and Jensen's Alpha. We can use these to assess risk-adjusted performance. However, different investors will have different investment techniques, and so no one single advanced metric is always going to be the best for assessing fund performance. And so that's where I'm going to leave off here. If you have any questions, obviously, please feel free to reach out to me via phone or email or just showing up at my office. If you don't have questions, well, I'll see you in class.